this as we go. So I thank God for that. So uh, I'm just going to leave this up for a moment, then I take it down. Uh, so I wanted to, to share from this theme, love, the spirit of life, the spirit of God, which is our theme for today, which is rooted in Pentecost. So there are three, three points that um, I want to just leave with you or ask you to consider uh, as we go through today. The first one is a question. What happened on the day of Pentecost? We know scripturally we can find the record of this in the book of Acts chapters one and two. And then we see the aftermath throughout the book of Acts and throughout the New Testament. But the question is really more of a personal one, a perceptional question for those that are uh, more uh, um, astute in uh, the scripture. And for those that are not, there may be a question that you're just pondering. I don't know anything about it. What happened on the day of Pentecost? Um, the second point that I want to uh, focus on is this notion of the language of love, your unity and diversity. And I wanna connect this with this idea of Pentecost, the language of love, unity and diversity. And then the final thought is a more excellent way. Uh, so I'm gonna stop this and um, just share with you uh, what, uh, what was given to me um, as I pondered this notion. So in the book of Acts, I'll just recap this real quickly for those that are not familiar with it. In Acts, the first chapter, um, it begins by saying, in the third verse, and when they were come in, they went up into an upper room. And in that upper room, we, we, the scripture details the um, uh, disciples were there, uh, all except Judas, the one that had betrayed Jesus, but also uh, the women, as the scripture de describes it, and the mother, Mary, the mother of Jesus. But it said that these all continued with one accord in prayer and supplication. Then it continues in chapter two of Acts, and it says, when the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. And then something happens. And it says, and suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled all the house where they were sitting. And there appeared unto them clothing tongues as a fire, and it set upon each of them, and they were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. So I want to talk about this and just lay a quick foundation and maybe the next 10 minutes um, to give you something to think about. And I want to leave a few minutes for some reflections, questions, and comments on what I share. So finding one's way after a traumatic event is difficult to do. Our human brain, I believe, is hardwired to create pathways for normalcy that allows for continued practice of repetitive behaviors and relationship connectors. It matters the difference if one's normal is chaotic, if it's violent, toxic, death reinforcing, or if it's a balanced life, peaceful, healthy, and life affirming. What we cling to is what is familiar. This points back to what Brenda shared. And it's what allows us to go about our daily routine with little to no psychic or cognitive interruption. So we pick up this story on the day of Pentecost in Acts, the first and second chapters. And what we know or what's known scripturally, because that's where we know what happened is from these texts, uh, is that these followers of Jesus had all been traumatized, probably in the worst way possible. Uh, by the brutal and unjust execution of their mentor, their brother, their friend, their son, um, their spiritual leader. Um, he was executed as a political prisoner of the state. Death, because of its finality, like nothing else, interrupts and disrupts and challenges our norm. Everything one knows to be true potentially comes into question when there's a death because it's as if the earth moves underneath you. Relationships shift. One's sense of self is in question. Who am I without this person in my life? I've only known myself in relationship with this person. Now I have to rethink about who am I without this person in my life? Trauma can either bring us together or create an almost irreparable divide. 
We're familiar with what's you know, when there's the death of a loved one, how families either been can be caught up in a tug of war fighting each other, or they can embrace each other in their pain and in love. For Jesus's few followers, almost all of whom had deserted him at his most vulnerable hour. I mean, they knew he was going to be killed and their fear for their own lives, their discontent perhaps with him and their expectations of what he should be, what he should do. Uh, for whatever reason, they, they abandoned him, save for his mother, a uh, few of the women and one of his followers. But what we also know that a short time after, after the third day after his death, um, they gained an experience, they had an experience of his presence. And you know, this presence or this experience was first retold uh, by the women close to Jesus. And then as they told it to him, to others and others had a similar experience. So was this an aberration? Did they see a ghost perhaps? Was it their own guilt? for some of them haunting them that had them having these visions of their loved one. It's not unfamiliar when we lose someone, it seems like every time we turn around, you know, we feel their presence. Uh, we may dream about them more vividly. Uh, we may encounter someone or be out somewhere and think we see them or someone that looked like them. Or we can ask, was the power of the love that they experienced when they were in physical relationship with Jesus, he was here in the flesh, was that power stronger than the death that they witnessed at the cross? Meaning, was that power of his love for them and ultimately their love for him, could that love not be stopped at the grave? And is that why they begin to have these experiences. What we know is that this relatively small group of people came together in prayer and to comfort one another. There's nothing like our pain to bring us together. And I, I don't, I'm not sure why psychologically that is. And perhaps uh, a sister Bandley could share some light on that, but you know, we will celebrate with each other to an extent, but rarely do we bond or even have support groups about our joy and our successes and what we've achieved. But when we are in pain as humans, we have a way of coming together even against and across our differences to comfort or just to sit with each other in that pain. So it is worthy to note that when they came together in what the scriptures describe as an upper room. And, and I suggest to you that rather than thinking of a three or two story uh, building, think about this as a place of consciousness. It was an upper area of, the, of their sense of self and their sense of each other, an awareness that was elevated. They were in a conscious state of being that was elevated. It was above what they were used to and familiar with. And in this state of awareness, something interesting happened. Besides their pain, their grief, they found unity. They found oneness and for but a short time, they existed in love one for another. It was in this place they experienced the manifestation that has come to be known as being filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, perhaps what they experienced, but for a brief period was what it is like to exist with no boundaries of separation what it is to exist in pure love one for another. The interesting thing is that they were able to understand each other in ways they previously could not. I mean, there was no love lost probably between any of them before this event. Certainly Jesus's family members had not followed him prior to his death, his mother, but not his other siblings. The disciples had infighting amongst themselves before Jesus's death. So, so the women were really on the outside before Jesus's death, but they found a way in this moment to rise above their pain at a higher state of consciousness. They understood each other. 
They also understood languages of which they were not trained and did not speak. So boundaries and barriers and divisions and things that separate us suddenly collapsed. They weren't there anymore. Think for a moment, if you would, about your own experience with traumatic events or life-altering situations. For example, learning of the sudden or unexpected death of a friend or loved one, a doctor's report of a serious illness or the sudden loss of a job, a sudden breakup in a relationship, or learning of a betrayal in a friend or a marriage, or more closely to where we're at now, two and a half years living in a pandemic. Each of these situations involve events that occur either suddenly or that interrupts or disrupts what's normal for us. I want to take this a little further and suggest that what we're experiencing in our world, our country, our communities, with both the pandemic and all of these uh, open acts of violence, um, is that there is a psychic disruption. There's a demand in us this, this tension between wanting things to go back to be normal or trying to find what is normal to being pushed into another place. In a sense, we are isolated from each other and we can't really be up close and personal like we're used to. But in another sense, we're, we're bonding with each other because we have similar pains and similar uh, events that are happening in our lives that's creating this space where, where we need one another as we have never been before. I would suggest that it is our spirit or spirituality, what we call here, I like to call energy or essence or vibration, that which we are, that requires the clearing of the space that we're at energetically, uh, spiritually able to flow unhindered by distractions and processes and transitions in the material realm that allows us to find this space of unity, even in our discord and even in our pain. I want to just ask you to consider this, that if there is that which we think of as what happened on the day of Pentecost, um, I would offer, and I ask you to have your own ideas about what that is, is that perhaps that there ability, their pain pushed them to a place where nothing else mattered, nothing else mattered. And in that space, they were able to come together in a unity they had never experienced before. I would suggest that in that space of that oneness is where they all experience this indwelling, this infusion, this, this storm, this of uh, the spirit, what they we come to know as the Holy Spirit through the language of scripture as just engulfing them. That they all experienced it simultaneously. And in that space, there was a oneness that was created. And it was from that oneness that they had a power, they had an ability, that they, they had the agency to do what prior to that they had not been able to do. So it wasn't an individual act or an individual encounter or an individual experience. It was a community experience. So the language of love, unity in diversity suggests to me that our individual power is magnified far beyond our individual potential when we are able to come together in our transparency and our essence and find common ground where we can become one in community without diminishing who we are as individuals. It is in that space that we have that transformative power to change the world. It is in that space that they found love because they, from moving from that space there, they had all things, the scripture refers as all things common. They were able to, those that were wealthy and rich, sold their goods and shared with those that did not have. Um, they made sure everybody's needs were met. They weren't concerned about their individualism and what one person had and what the other one didn't have, but they as a community moved through um, in something new that was uh, so different 
from what the world had experienced. And I would suggest that that small group of people, it wasn't apparent that day, but it has become apparent since then, shifted the cosmos. They changed the trajectory of the world. They transformed the world. Although that unity was short-lived and, and that loving expression was short-lived, nonetheless, it gives us a template for today. As we look out into our world and we see what is lacking, what do we need? And we bemoan all the things we, we don't like as the world is becoming something we don't recognize. What does it mean to be a divine human? What does it mean to think about how we can be another kind of human being? The kind that does, you know, do, doesn't randomly kill and shoot one another. The kind that doesn't um, dishonor our sister and brother because they are different and we don't understand who or what they are. The kind of human being that always move through with a connectedness to one another. I suggest that the day of Pentecost gives us a template of our potential as divine human beings to work together, walk together, have power together and our unity in the diversity of who we are. But it also shows us a more excellent way that it is through that unity that our love is actualized. It is through that unity and through that love that we have power to transform, to change and make this world the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven here on earth. I'm gonna pause there, Ashe. I think we have a few moments where we can have, if someone would like to respond, have a question or comment. If not, we'll transition to Brenda. Um, can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Um, well, first that was a, a great word, awesome word. But it just put in my mind as I'm thinking that we don't celebrate today or fully recognize what Pentecost actually was or is. Uh, because we're still so segregated in our denominations and in our churches. And it's about the Holy Spirit falling down on a group of people. And we never consider that the diversity of it, that all of these people who spoke a different language, and it's not tongue, we confuse this a lot of time with speaking in tongue, mm -hmm. but the diversity was not about speaking in tongue, it was about different nationalities, different languages, and at that moment, it didn't matter what language you spit, you spoke, everything was said was understood, and there was yes. a unity, uh, because Jesus is love. So mm -hmm. that says to me, the Holy Spirit that was sent as a comforter has to be based and rooted in love. Mm -hmm. um, and it reminded me of a service that uh, Sister Sandra, Reverend Sandra and I watched where the minister was Caucasian. His church was a Caucasian church, but the anointing was universal. The yes. anointing in that place was so powerful. It didn't matter what color they were. It didn't matter what, what even denomination, it was all about the Holy Spirit. And until we can get back to the point in our lives, in this society, in our community, where we work under the anointing of the Holy Spirit, and we led and we're guided by that, and then all the diversity, we won't see color. We won't look over and see you're different, so I have to stay over here. No, we'll all be on one accord. And that's where, what I think Pentecost is all about, and I think it was broken down very, very well. You know, it's a universal regardless of the language we speak, it's a universal love that we need in this world today. Ashe, amen, Beverly. I, I just mm -hmm. ditto that, Reverend Beverly, that we, we have to begin to think about, um, I mean, at what point will our pain in this life, in this world, become to that level where we are forced to come together? We, we've cried tears, I know I have over these past few weeks with, uh, past few years, but more recently with Buffalo and, and the dear family that lost loved ones. Recently with uh, um, Texas and, and the babies that lost. When will we be able to move beyond our differences and say, we are all divinely human 
the spirit of God dwells in all of us. And we can see that rather than what separates us. And we can love and allow that spirit to just exist in us and allow those walls that we have up to become bridges to bring us together rather than keeping us separate. Thank you.